this month, who is Cindy Brown, coming back for a much anticipated Yay. workshop. She's the author of the wonderfully titled Matt Death, Sound of Murder, Oliver Twisted, and other great books. And we're delighted to have you back, Cindy. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes. So as some of you remember, I was I presented a workshop back in July and um, was asked to give it again with a little bit more interaction and expansion. So that's what this is. So hopefully um, you won't say, so that's the same stuff because we're gonna be talking about it a little bit more. Um, and yes, I'm the author of uh, Six Mysteries, uh, published by Henry Press. Um, and also I had um, a short story in the Murder Most Theatrical Anthology by Malice Domestic that came out this last November. And I'm also the author of two ghost-written nonfiction books, um, both traditionally published. So I've got that kind of background. And right now I am working on both a, uh, a mystery and kind of a I call it a charming book. It's not quite, a, I don't want to call it a comedy, it's, but I, a charming book, a lighthearted um, book. I'm kind of taking my, my lighthearted mysteries and separating them with a serious mystery and a, a more lighthearted book. So um, that's me. I've been writing professionally for uh, uh, 20 years, I guess. Um, my, I make my living as a writer. And, uh, but started out as a playwright, which we'll talk about a little bit because my, my way that I plot is out of dramatic structure. So I started out as a playwright and then went to a screenwriter and um, have a certificate in screenwriting and, you know, went to school and all that good stuff. But um, yeah, so that's me. And today we're going to talk about mystery because that's what I love. Um, that's what I kind of cut my teeth on in terms of fiction. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I remember um, I started out with uh, the John D. McDonald books. After, first of all, I, I started out, of course, with Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden and those ones. And then at one point, my dad, um, I think I was probably 14, handed me a John D. McDonald book and said, don't tell your mother I'm letting you read this. Because <laughs> of course, sex and violence and all those things. Uh -huh. and, um, and he was wonderful. I, I, I tried to read him again now and he's a little dated, but he uh, that's where I really learned to love mystery and then on to Sue Grafton was the first person that really made me think I wanted to write because I wanted to write like Sue Grafton. I loved her, um, Kinsey Malone, I loved her PI. And uh, I loved the fact that it was West Coast. Uh, most of the, before that, a lot of the, everything I think I'd read had been East Coast or maybe Chicago. So um, I really enjoyed that. So that's, that's a little bit about me and my background. And today, I think, did all of you guys get the handout that I, um, sent out? Yes. So we're going to be going through that. Um, and this is interactive. So I want you to ask questions, you know, stop me, wave if I'm, you know, on a roll. And we're also going to have a couple of breakout sessions. And it looks like, oops, we already have a chat. I should open that. Oh, somebody has to go for vaccination. Okay, well, good. Good job, Peter, for getting one. <laughs> I will also keep the chat open in case you want to um, ask me things in the chat. So we're gonna first talk about, one of the things we didn't talk about last time was um, genre and subgenre in mystery because there are um, a lot of them. And one of the things that you should probably, one of the reasons you should probably know about them is because there are different expectations, reader expectations for each of these types of genres. So when you're going into writing a book, if you're going to be writing a traditional mystery, you kind of need to know what the expectation is. If you're going to be writing a PI mystery, you're going to kind of need to know what those expectations are. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. And we're also, when we break out into our groups, um, your we're, each of the groups is going to have a genre assigned to it. So it's going to be kind of, so, so listen up. Um, I guess the first thing to think about is what type of book you want to write. Uh, mysteries vary widely, as you know, from the, um, you know, really violent serial killer mysteries with intestines and things uh, to cozy mysteries where, you know, the, the victim eats, you know, chokes on a piece of pizza at the local parlor and the cat discovers him and, you know, hilarity ensues. So we have a really wide range. But the basic, uh, the, the three most popular genres, and then we're gonna talk about some of the others, 
are cozy or traditional, um, PI, and police. And then they all have different things going on with them. And then we'll talk about um, a couple of the, the suburb, even sub suburb genres in a second. Genres. So uh, a cozy or traditional mystery. The first thing to know is there's um, no violence on the page. In fact, if you look at Malice Domestic, which is the conference and association associated with traditional mysteries, which would be like Agatha Christie is the queen of traditional mysteries. That's why it's called the Agatha Award. I was up for that, by the way. Yeah, um, didn't win. But anyway, uh, so traditional mysteries have it's there's no blood on the page. There's no there's no sex on the page either. You might you know somebody might discreetly go into a room somewhere, but it's not on the page. Um, the, there's, in, in most of them, and a lot of them, depending on the publisher, there are, is no swearing. In fact, I had a friend who, uh, who ha had described cowboy boots as shit kickers, and her publisher made her take it out, because, you know, shit. So, anyway, a lot of them have that. Um, they also tend to make sure the the victim knows the killer in traditional mysteries. So it's not the kind of thing where you're chasing a serial killer or um, it's a police investigation. It's usually, that's why I think, kind of think Agatha Christie. There's a group of people, they all have a grudge. One of them's the killer. So that's kind of the traditional mystery. People that fit into that besides Agatha um, would be, um, Oh my gosh, there's so many cozy mystery writers. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the famous ones because of course I think of my friends instead. But I'll tell you my friends, Ellie Alexander, uh, who lives in Ashland, um, does lots of lovely ones. Um, Sherry Harris. Um, well, if you look at Kensington books, you'll find a bunch of uh, mystery, cozy mysteries. They tend to have, they tend to have covers that are very quaint and um, they might, Feature. Oh, the other thing about a cozy, not a traditional, but a cozy, is that um, they tend to take place in small towns, small towns or small villages. It is the kind of thing where someone wants to kind of escape and live in that place. So the protagonists often like run a and b or they run or they have their own bakery or um, uh one of them it runs yard sales. I mean, they do something like that and they have a group of friends because it's, they're always serious and people like to go back to them because they want to kind of visit that place. Um, one of the people who kind of straddles a couple of genres who's very popular is Louise Penny. Uh, Louise is considered a traditional uh, mystery writer, even though she has a little bit of language in hers, partly because um, there's, very, there's no violence or sex. And again, she has this place that she's created called Three Pines, where you want to go back and visit all the people that are there. And they're, and they're in every book. The group of people around her or, or, or the protagonist is in every book. Um, other kind of traditional mysteries, a lot of the Brits, I think, fit into this. Uh, one of my favorite is Anne Cleves, um, who writes, if you've ever watched the Vera series on television or Shetland, which are both wonderful, wonderful series, that's her. Um, she also kind of slides into police, as does um, Louise Penny, so we'll talk about that next. Because they both have, oh, and the other thing about cozies, not traditional, but cozies, amateur sleuth. It's always an amateur sleuth. It's somebody who owns a business, is a dog walker, they're doing something like that. They're not a professional PI. They're not a professional um, a policeman. And one of the difficulties, um, well, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so the next one would be police. And police, there's a couple different um, subgenres in there. Uh, and I would say that uh, Louise Penny's is probably, there's basically the policeman. And he's usually kind of on his own. Um, often he's retired. Um, uh, and he's, or he's been kicked off the force, but he knows all the police stuff. Okay, so there's that one. There's what we call a police procedural. 
And um, Vera kind of slides into police procedural, if you've ever seen it, because one of the things that happens in police procedural is it's the team and you're finding out how they're gonna solve it. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, you'll see the meeting, if you're watching TV or in, in the book, there'll be the meeting, there'll be the whiteboard and they'll stick the photos up on the whiteboard and they'll say, you know, so-and-so was found murdered in, you know, and her body was in the pond and they'll, they'll be talking about it because they're talking to a whole team and we're seeing the way that the team is going to help solve it. Even though there's one protagonist, there's people that are helping. Um, if any of you have ever read Ed McBain, he's kind of the granddaddy and one of the wonderful, wonderful writers of police procedurals. Um, so you've got that, and Bosch, I mean, um, all the Michael Connelly books, his kind of go back and forth between, and like, there's a lot of sliding. And also this is, uh, if you look online afterwards about genres, you'll find people that agree completely with me and you'll find people that go, well, it's this, and it's this, and it's this too. So there's a little sliding in there. Um, uh, but Michael Connelly with Bosch, um, Harry Bosch, those are wonderful books. And But he also kind of slides because he, at points he's a policeman and he's working on the force and at points he's like kicked off the force, right? So he's got a little more autonomy. So that's, um, that's a little how the, the police ones work. To, the readers are um, expecting you have to make sure with all mysteries, you really, really want to do your research. But I would say, especially with police procedurals, because police read them and they will tell you um, what's wrong with them. Um, there is a wonderful listserv called um, Crime Scene Listserv. I will, uh, during your break, I will, when you're on break, I will um, put it in the chat room. And it's full of uh, first responders and authors, and you can ask them anything. So there are policemen on there, there's firemen, there's PIs, there's forensic examiners. And so if you have a question about how the police might function or something like that, or a forensic question, you can ask them and the group answers. That's really, really helpful. Um, but especially if you're gonna write something about police, it's good to have um, that knowledge. You don't have to have a policeman in your pocket. Although, you know, there are actually, I have several have, that helped me with it. I have several retired cops that helped me. And with the last, um, the mystery I'm writing right now, I met with Sheriff Reese. I just, I knew somebody who knew him. I called him up and I said, can I meet with you? I want to ask you a couple of questions about how this might work. And he was really gracious. Gave me a, he, he's the sheriff of Multnomah County, if you don't know. Um, he's very gracious. So the police thing, the biggest thing that people are expecting is, um, Accuracy. The PI novel um, is a little bit different. And again, you have to be, uh, you, you need to be accurate, but it's not so much the police, the PI novel has a lot of room to work um, because you're, you're, their person's a professional and they understand what needs to go on in an investigation. They're often ex-police, ex-military, something like that. And the one thing that people are expecting in a, in a PI novel is they want to make sure that the there's a lot they want to there needs to be a lot of sleuthing the guy needs to have and he has needs, usually wants to have something that makes sets him or her apart and um, that makes them different so that they know they can figure out the killer and usually they work pretty much on their own they might have a sidekick but if you think like um sue grafton skinsey malone you know, she didn't really have a sidekick. Every so often she had friends and she had her neighbor, Henry, and things like that, but there was no person she really worked with. Um, so there's, those are the three biggest subgenres. Uh, we also have historical, which is actually really big right now. Um, and historical mystery, uh, they both, they kind of range from, sometimes you'll have a professional sleuth you'll have, it'll be a detective, um, in which case it, you're gonna be doing even more research than you would if you had an amateur sleuth, uh, because you wanna know how actually, you know, the police force worked if you did a, for example, one in Victorian times or something like that. Uh, Lori R. King does a lot of um, historical mysteries. Reese Bowen does historical mysteries. Um, they're, they're lovely. They're, I would love to write one. I'm a little scared of them because you have to really know your stuff, but you also have a lot of leeway because you can um, 
you can create situations that you might not be able to create now. Um, and also one of the things that might be helpful in a historical mystery is I, I never forget having a cab driver. I was on my way to some kind of mystery workshop and I was drinking a cab and I told the cab driver what I was doing. He says, there is no mystery anymore. I said, what? He goes, I have a cell phone. I have this, people know where I am all the time. There's no mystery. <laughs> and I have to say, cell phones make it a lot harder to write mysteries. You might think about, because I mean, it's easier to track people. There's a lot of, there's things you can do, but it makes it difficult. Um, we have spy, of course there's spy uh, mysteries. They're a little different. Um, usually, you know, there's a, a, something really big at stake. Alan First, I think is one of the great, and um, John LeCrae are some of the great mystery spy novelists. And those kind of like said, kind of mystery, kind of not. Uh, there's also paranormal where there's something otherworldly going on. Um, you know, sometimes those are often more of a, a cozy mystery or sometimes even a romantic kind of suspense. And briefly, before I ask to see if you have any questions about it, um, there are two things that are very popular that I, I consider kind of outside the mystery realm, but they are uh, crime novels. And one is the thriller and the other is the suspense novel. And they're both very, very popular. Um, but for our purposes today, we won't be dealing with them. But a thriller is high stakes, high action. Um, think Jack Reacher. The whole world is at stake unless you can find the guy with the bomb, that kind of thing. Um, they're very adrenaline fueled, they're very fast paced, and uh, and you know, yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're definite page turners. They also tend to be pretty big because there's a lot of stuff going on, the plots, you know, there's a lot of different kind of plots going on because they usually have a big, big scope. The other thing that's really popular right now is suspense. And um, yeah, and suspense is basically, there is, it's very individual, it's kind of intimate. And um, the protagonist is a danger and there's a lot of tension. And the protagonist is in danger, but she doesn't know, or he, it's often she, it's almost always she, which kind of bugs me to tell you the truth. Um, they're in danger and they're trying to figure out who's dangerous, who's endangering them. It's often very intimate. It's often a husband or a spouse or a sister or a babysitter or a neighbor. Um, one definition I found, which is pretty good, is a naive main character confronting evil. Although they're not always that naive because Gone Girl would definitely be suspense and neither of those characters are particularly naive. Um, but I'm keeping thriller and suspense separate because they're not, they don't often have the cast of characters that a mystery has. A mystery has suspects. Um, in a thriller or suspense, you often know who it is. You just don't know how somebody's going to get away or how somebody's going to save the world. So... I just kind of want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about those so you get an idea of, like I said, the kind of books. And now we're going to be working with those a little bit later. But now, anybody have questions or comments about those kind of books or the genres? Nope, but I'm going to look at Bo uh, Bobby Holmes, whoever I, from Ruth. Thank you about that. Bobby Holmes, Cozy Paranormal. Okay, so... From then, you want to look at your premise. How do you come up with a good idea? And I'm like the, the queen of ideas, so I have no problem with it. <laughs> but I have a couple different things that happen over and over. And I've also taken some classes that have really helped me figure out how to kind of distill premise. And we're going to come up with a group one here in a minute. So be thinking about this. So some people, um, actually, I'm just going to go through my books really quickly and tell you how I came up with the premise for each of them because they were all slightly different. So the first one, uh, Macduff, I just knew that I wanted, um, if you might know that Macduff, Macbeth is supposed to be a cursed play. And I knew that I wanted um, the king who dies in the, um, in the play, King Duncan, I wanted him to die for real. I wanted him to die 
and everybody wonder about the curse. And I just, it was a really kind of vague idea, but I knew I wanted the king to die. I knew I wanted it to be about the curse. Um, that was my premise for Macbeth. The second one, The Sound of Murder, um, came about, the premise came about from a, an offhand comment my father made. He said he was on a, a posse at Sun, in Sun City West, a retirement area in, um, in Arizona. And the posse is like a volunteer police department, which ends up being in the book because I thought it was a great idea. Um, and he said, you know, we've had a surprising number of suicides lately. And he said, we always have suicides, you know, and then this is a over 60 community, right? And that was all he said. And I thought, ah, what if they weren't suicides? So it was just an offhand comment that somebody made that I kind of grabbed a hold of and thought, that could be interesting. Um, the third one, I, it was, um, I kind of riffed on a theme. It's Oliver Twisted, is the, and so I knew because I was writing about Oliver Twist, I wanted to write something about orphans, and I knew I wanted to write something about class structure because those are both in Oliver Twist. But, and this is where it started getting fun. This is what I want you to really pay attention to. I had been to a screenwriting um, workshop by Michael Art, who wrote Little Miss Sunshine. And I guess he's done some of the Star Wars um, movies too since then. And he said, write about what pisses you off. You may remember this from last time. This is my best advice you can have. Write about what pisses you off. And, um, I was thinking about that when I was looking at Oliver Twisted, and one of the things that um, that pissed me off was when I started looking into orphans. Is there is a people are still selling children, people are still selling children in Eastern Europe. It's still happening, so that became a big one. Um, and then also I uh, I have a little. Uh, uh, I have an issue sometimes with people that believe that um, all you have to do is believe something and it will come true and people that don't get their cancer cured or whatever just aren't believing hard enough, that kind of thing. So that went into the book and those became part of my plot points. In um, the fourth book, I Had to Get Your Gun, that was a newspaper article. My mom sent me a newspaper article about um, uh, a reenactment at the OK Corral when one of the cowboy actors actually shot the other cowboy actor because he didn't, he had real bullets in his gun. He thought he had blanks, but he had real bullets in his gun. And so that became, I said, well, what if, what if somebody put the bullets in there on purpose, right? So that became the premise. So that was a newspaper article. So they're coming from ideas, they're coming from other books, they're coming from newspaper articles. In that one, I also put in something that pissed me off, which was, um, I, I found it kind of accidentally. Uh, it's a story of Annie Oakley. I mean, it's not the story of Annie Oakley, but she becomes in the book because it's, I had to get your gun. And I found out that um, the way she was represented in Annie Get Your Gun is so opposite who she actually was. And, um, and I felt like I, I just felt she'd been done such a dis disservice because she was such an amazing woman who ended up in that musical and in the movie looking like just a, a sharp shooting kind of ninny. Sorry. So anyway, so that pissed me off. So I, that became part of the, this plot. Um, and I, I don't have to keep going, but you've got the idea. It's, it's sometimes it'll be actually something someone says. It's a newspaper article. It's um, just an idea, or like I said, um, with mine, I knew things that I had to write because I had um, constructs that my publisher wanted me to deal with. But um, I, I really think when you have that passion about writing, you know, writing a wrong, you know, that I think really can fuel your writing, whether it's a mystery or not. Um, So any ideas, any other ideas you guys have? Well, how do you guys get your ideas? Anybody have something different? <clears throat> well, Cindy, I think mine's a little bit different. What I do is I go to either grocery stores or, or museums or whatever, and I look, I look for little postcards. And whatever postcard gets my attention immediately, 
I buy it and I take it home and I write a mur murder mystery on it. Ah, uh -huh. so you're a, a visual idea. Yeah. Awesome, that's wonderful. Anybody else? And all these could work because everybody gets their ideas differently. Yeah. Anybody else have another one? I'm writing down that visual one. That's really good, Joe. Um, okay. And today, I'm use actually, I got going on a roll. I'm going to kind of use um, Phantom of Oz as uh, an example today for some of it. That's, that's the Phantom of Oz. It is a, um, it's my fifth book. I kind of call it a cozy gothic because it takes place in the haunted theater. Um, and this one, uh, I, in fact, this is, this is another way of doing it. I knew I wanted to write a gothic. I thought it'd be really fun to write something kind of creepy and spooky. So I knew I had that idea in my head. So I knew there had to be a ghost, right? Because you're gonna have to have a ghost that, or something that felt like a ghost. But then the things that pissed me off in this one, um, I, one of the things that piss, pisses me off is the uh, media, uh, media industry's obsession with weight. It's getting a little bit better, but it's still pretty bad. And so that really bothered me. And so that goes into here. One of the characters is um, struggling with uh, bulimia and there's a whole thing with that going on in here. And another thing that happens that really pisses me off is um, scammers who prey on the vulnerable. And I had actually, it was a little bit like you, Joe, I saw a billboard um, and it was a billboard for, want to be a model? You know, call such and such and such and such. And having been an actor, I knew that that was a scam. It's not basically just, by the way, if anybody ever tells you, you know, do you want to be a model and then ask for your money? It's a scam. That doesn't know how it works. So, <clears throat> and that one was pissing me off because it was looking obviously um, aimed at young people and Christian people. And I thought, ah, double whammy, man. They're trying to like pretend like they're nice and good and they're aiming at young people and yet they're going to take their money. So that made me mad. And so there is a, uh, a scammer in here as well <clears throat> that's preying on um, Ivy's brother who is, uh, has a cognitive disability and so he's especially vulnerable. So that's where those kind of premises came from. Um, protagonists. We're going to move on to protagonists. We're going to move on to the people. But before we do, any kind of questions or comments just about the world of mystery or the world of premise or thing like that? We're going to talk about plot and character. And I'm, and I'm basically kind of starting you off with a... We're not starting with plot. We're starting with idea and character. It's really about writing a character-based mystery. We're good? Okay. Um, would psychological mystery be a different, separate character? That's a good question. Psychological mystery is probably psychological suspense. So I, I would put it in a different mist category. Like I said, they kind of blur. Um, that's from Ruth. Uh, and so I would say something like Rebecca um, or what's another psychological? Well, like Gone Girl is kind of psychological. Girl on the Train, uh, Woman on the Train, Girl on the Train. What was it called? Girl on the Train, Woman in the Window. There's all those ones like that. I would, I would classify those as suspense myself just because um, they're not about who did it so much as what's going on. And they might be a little bit about who did it, but it's a very close... Um, it's typically a very close uh, victim and killer. Like I said, it's often family or love related or, or your best friend, something like that. So I, I would call them slightly different. I would call it suspense. They're very popular um, and they get categorized. If you look in Amazon and the best mystery list, it'll, it'll get categorized under mystery. <clears throat> but if you start talking to people in the industry, the publishers, the agents, the editors, those kind of things, they would probably um, categorize it slightly differently. Okay, on to protagonist. We have two basically, there's, well, there's, yeah, there's basically two. You get professional or amateur. Um, and professional, of course, is gonna be your PI, your police officer. Um, every so often you'll have something different like, um, 
uh, what's her name that does the um, coroner ones or did the coroner ones? Patricia Cornwell. Um, who can I admit, Robin? I've admitted her. I think I could. There we go. Um, yeah, so every so often you'll have somebody different. You'll have, um, or you'll also have, if you have like a medical one, or if you have a legal uh, mystery, you would have still be professional because they're a lawyer or they're a doctor. There's somebody who knows their stuff. Those kind of teeter on the edge between professional and amateur. They're kind of like on that. Yeah. We have police and PI here. And then probably, and probably medical examiner and forensic experts probably still up here too. And then other people who are professionals in their fields are probably here. And then we have an amateur down here. And the amateur is going to typically um, be, like I said, a cozy mystery or traditional mystery. There's somebody who is drawn in for some reason. Um, the murder happens in their place of business. The murder happens with their neighbor. The murder um, is, you know, happens to their best friend and no one else will solve it. Um, they're really fun to do because, of course, you can be kind of a little bumbling and you don't have to know They'll have to learn what to do. You can't not do your research still. They'll have to learn what to do, but it's not as, um, you have a little bit more leeway in some ways. But the one thing that's really difficult about an amateur sleuth is you have to make sure, and especially if you're going to have a series, you need to figure out why they keep being drawn into the crime. Why do they keep being drawn into um, what's going on? Because if you don't, we, we call it Cabot Cove syndrome. Do you guys remember Jessica Fletcher in Cabot Cove, the murder she wrote? Remember how she just would like stumble on the body? And you're going, there can't be that many people dead in Cabot Cove. It's a small town, but she kept, you know, running into them. So you don't want them to just kind of keep running into them. There's got to be some reason that they are drawn in. Um, and that can be difficult. Um, in my first book because she has, uh, I had Ivy, she is drawn into the murder because it is of her friend. Everyone else believes it's uh, that he drank himself to death. I'm giving a little bit away, but not too much. She doesn't. So nobody's, it's not being investigated. Um, there's a whole thing about his body being, you know, uh, buried ahead of time. There's no autopsy. It's all these kind of things that are just, that she feels convinced that he would not have done that. And so she, that's one of the things that pulls her along. But I have to admit, one of my things about when I'm as a reader is I, I don't always like um, amateur sleuths finding bodies. And so I knew I wanted her to become uh, a private investigator. So she, or work, and so in the very beginning the book, she works with her uncle, the private investigator, and um, Uncle Bob, and then she, eventually becomes one. So the first couple of, the first two books, she's really drawn in because there's something going on. Because in the second book, she's still really not an investigator either. So there, she's drawn in because something's happening and no one's paying attention to it. Um, actually, the second book, I'm going to backtrack. The second book, she actually did, does get drawn in because of her PI experience or her PI ability. So she starts becoming a, a hybrid because I found it difficult, and like I said, as a, I find it difficult as a reader even to, um, to do that, to, find, to, to um, what's the word I want when you, when you have to put your realistic expectations aside, there's a word for that, a term. You know what I mean? Anybody? Now, suspend belief, suspend disbelief, that's it. I find it difficult to suspend my disbelief um, sometimes with amateur sleuths. So I ended up working around it that way. But people do a really nice job of it. Nice from Ruth. It seems to me, I don't know if you guys can all see the chat. In the amateur sleuth category, there's often a tension between the amateur and the professionals um, and or romance, yes. Um, and that's very true um, on both sides because you kind of need those professionals in the book because there, if there's a murder or there's gonna be a, police presence. There's going to be a, somebody there, a PI, something like that. They often have a romance so that she can, you know, she or he, um, they're often she, can um, learn from the PI. 
uh, kind of like I did with Uncle Bob, but it's not a romance. So that often happens. And of course, there's going to be tension because they're, you know, the police see them as, you know, bumbling and messing up the investigation. Of course, they end up, you know, um, solving it. So that there's always some tension and that makes, that's good. We need tension in those. So the one thing that so we're, we're going to kind of think about, in fact, you're going to be thinking about this in a minute. You want to think about um, if, if you want a professional or an amateur. Oh, and I forgot to say on the amateur, what makes them interesting? Um, okay, I'm going to throw this out to you guys. Think about, oopsie, I just lost, did I just lose you? There you are. I just pulled up something. So can you guys think of some amateur sleuths that you can just throw out there really quickly? Anybody? The kids in Scooby-Doo. Father Brown. What's that? Father Brown. Father Brown. Okay, great. I love Father Brown. What makes him interesting? I don't, I don't really find that very interesting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if other priest. people, does anybody else watch Father Brown? Yeah. Okay. Why do you why do you find him interesting, or at least why do you keep watching him? Why do you watch him? His outlook's interesting because he's a priest. Okay. There we go. We've got the priest. Uh, same thing with Grant Chester, but a different kind of outlook, right? Yeah. We've got an outlook that's different because they're a priest. They have a spiritual, um, and they're you know they hopefully a good spiritual outlook, and they're confronting evil. So we've got that kind of interesting thing going on. Any other amateur sleuths people can think of? I like Cleo Coyle's uh, series with, uh, I, but I can't remember the name of the character, oh. but she's a coffee shop owner. That's and right. And so there's a lot in there about kind of New York art culture and different, and different types of coffee. And I feel like I always learn something. Yes, and that is a great, that's great, Ruth, because that's one of the things that especially in a, in a cozy you do learn something about the community or the type of um of hobby or business that the protagonist is in so some of the cozies will even have like recipes okay so you might even find that interesting some of them will throw you into like you said the art world or the coffee world um there's one uh that i that's kind of a historical cozy that is um basically a takeoff on um, My Fair Lady. And it's really interesting because it's a takeoff. First of all, it's interesting because it's a takeoff of My Fair Lady, so you're interested in that. But it's also interesting because you're you're looking at that particular era and how, how people might be able to solve things in that era. Hmm. Anybody else? Any other amateurs uh, that you Molly, find Molly Hunt's Molly Hunt's books about the, um, the, I can't think of her name. It seems like it's something like Camille, Camellia. Um, she is uh, a volunteer at a cat shelter, and she has a bunch of cats um, on her own. And um, sometimes the cats have something to do with solving the mystery, but not always. But what yes. she puts in her book a lot of times are um, hints about um, facts and hints about cats. Exactly. And Molly's lovely, by the way. Um, if you ever want to have her talk to you guys, she's lovely. Um, yeah, yeah and exactly. You're learning about cats. You're learning about that world. If you're interested in cats, you're really going to be interested in that. Another, um, Chet and Bernie. You guys ever read the Chet and Bernie recipe? Uh, which I love oh, those. Yes. And you're going to, yes. you know, you're getting it from, okay, that one you're getting it from a dog's point of view, which is what's interesting. So your amateur sleuth has to have, they can't just be your average Joe off the street. They have to have something going for them and that calls people to them and keeps them interested. Your, your PI and your police um, can be a little bit different. They can be competent and like, so they usually have an extra something. They have, they're really good at puzzles. They're really observant. They're really good at reading people. There's usually something extra. What about them. Lucifer? Anybody watch that show? Keep people guessing. And, uh, and often there's one that, you know, I think it's kind of a long shot, but I make sure they're in there. Uh, the one that I just wrote, um, just finish is uh, there's somebody that I thought, oh, nobody's ever going to think that that's really, and a couple, a couple of my first readers thought it might be him. So that was really good. Um, so I like to have at least five. 
And you have to think about, and you're going to be doing this in a minute, how are they connected to the crime? And I, this is all the stuff that I do um, before I start. And we'll get to like outlining too, which you can or you don't have to do or not do. But I really, I don't feel like I can start um, without at least knowing those first couple of things. And I like to know my characters too. Sometimes people get at it along the way or sometimes I cut them along the way. I had a major character cut in Oliver Twisted when my editor just said, there's too many, you have too many suspects. So I cut one of them out. Um, I ended up adding one in um, Macduff too that I wasn't expecting that just kind of came up. But I do like to have an idea going in. So I would suggest at least five suspects and figure out how they're related to the crime. And for an example, I'm gonna use again, the, the Phantom of Oz. Um, so this book is the one I told you it's, um, it's set, they're all set in a theater, it's set in a haunted theater. Um, there is a disappearance and a murder. So I had actually more than five suspects, I had six. Because you want to have, um, in this one, uh, the person who disappears and the person who was murdered are also suspects at the beginning and maybe throughout the book. But how they, rec how they connect to it, so it's all set in the theater, right? Um, so one of them is the director of the piece. Pretty easy. He's also the um, boyfriend of another suspect who is the lead actress. Um, the reason her kind of connection and motivation, she is, uh, uh, she's the one who is bulimic and having a really hard time and is probably right now on some kind of, there's probably some kind of maybe um, substance abuse going on. Um, and she is also connected to Ivy. She's Ivy's friend. Ivy is of course, you know, the protagonist. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, oh shoot. Yes, I'll talk a little bit about Ivy in a minute. So we have those two. We have, I decided I wanted somebody in the, back, in the backstage because if this is gonna be a haunted theater, the theater is really important. So the technical <coughs> director, his name is Logan, is a suspect as well because things start going wrong in the theater and it could be him. It could be him that are making things fall and crash and things. Um, we have a reality TV star who is uh, trying to, uh, who's come to an audition to find her latest um, child star. Um, this is all, this is one of the other things that pissed me off about this when I was reading this, um, an article when I was getting my hair done about this woman who does Dance Mom. You guys, I don't know, it's like a reality TV show um, where this woman tries to make stars out of little girls um, who are dancers. And it sounded just, awful. She was awful to them and their mothers were awful. It was just it was so stage mom, but also, I mean, this is a reality star um, <clears throat> taking advantage of the kid. Um, then I had the person who, one of the, another actor who ended up having um, issues with two of the other suspects, the director and Candy, and ends up um, also getting a better role because of what goes on. And then I had the stage mom also, there's a stage mom in here too. So they, you could, I already knew what I was gonna be doing and I already knew how each of these people were connected and all of them have an issue. You wanna make sure that all of them have a reason and an issue um, to kill the person you're thinking about. So that's why it's funny, I like to write a little bit by the seat of my pants, but I think with a mystery, you really need to know who's killed and at least who did it, and then find your other characters around that. And that is what you are going to do right now. Ha! We're gonna have breakout sessions. And what we're gonna do in this breakout, oh, no, no, let's, I'm sorry. Back up, back up, back up. Before we have our breakout sessions, I want us to come up with a premise because we're all gonna use the same premise. Let's find something that we think would be great to write about. Something, hopefully, that pisses you off. Something that makes you mad. 
something you would like to see justice done? Anyway, so. race, racial, um, racial hatred. Racial hatred. Okay, there's one, and I heard another one say somebody something too. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, let's go just because in case there's a, I mean, in case somebody likes him, let's go religious with religious abuse. What's that? Religious abuse. Religious abuse. Mm -hmm. Ah, yep. Yeah. Okay. I have Actually, one, let's get a some, couple of them. Any others? Some, yeah, somebody thinks you're stupid just because you're an immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Others? Neighborhood zoning. Neighborhood zoning. <laughs> no, I, I mean, things get really hot around that. Okay. Others? A rooster. What's that? Someone having a rooster. A rooster. Ah. In the neighborhood. <laughs> that could fit in the neighborhood zoning, too. <laughs> I just know okay. about zoning from SimCity. What was that? Never mind, as a joke. Oh. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, let us as a group. Um, so everybody, can I, can I, do you guys that are not on video, do you have video? Can yes. Can turn it on for a second? There's a reactions button that people can use as well. And also I was going to say, so what I want to do, let's, I, let's, I'm going to put the rooster under neighborhood zoning. So I think we have four um, premises here, just kind of big ideas we want to think about. And so we're going to vote which one we want, because we're all going to have the same one. So the four of them are, just vote once, um, not right yet, but the four of them are racial hatred, religious abuse, um, denigrating or thinking immigrants are stupid, um, and, and neighborhood zoning, okay? So everyone who would like to write about racial hatred. Okay. Can you vote uh, multiple? Religious, oh, wait, how many was that? I got, I think I had two. Is that right? Racial hatred Wait, again. Can we vote for more than one? Okay, you know what? Let's go ahead and you can vote for more than one. Let's do it again. You can vote for more than one. Racial hatred. Wait, keep your right hands up because I got to count. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, religious abuse. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Uh, the immigrant issue. Steve, are you just keeping your hand up can for all of them? More, more, yes, you can vote for more than one. It, it's easy know. to raise your hand, but it's a lot harder to figure out how to put it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I keep counting you. Two. Wait, religious, uh, sorry, the, the immigrant. Sorry, immigrant again. One, two, three. Four. And neighborhood zoning. One, two, three, four. Okay, it looks like it is in between religious abuse and racial hatred, and I'm not sure, so let's get it, dial it down to that really quickly. Okay, so you can only vote for one now. Religious, uh, racial hatred. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think that's it. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to break up into these groups. We're going to, um, you've been assigned. Uh, where's Laura? You've assigned them groups. Yeah. Awesome. You're going to be assigned groups. The groups are, there's four of them. One of them is cozy or traditional mystery. One is PI. One is police. The last one is other. Whoever is in the other one, you're going to have to make a decision pretty quickly on what you'd like it to be, but it can be any of those three. It can also be historical. It can be um, spy. It can be paranormal. It can be noir. I forgot to talk about noir, which is basically, you know, the world is very, 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 very dark, and everything around, everything that works in that mystery points to the fact that, you know, life is dark. Um, so... 
you're going to be split into these groups. And what you're going to do in those groups is you are going to come up with your cast of characters. We're going to take 15 minutes um, to do this. You don't have to do too much about it at this point, but I have to want you to figure out your victim and your killer. And by the way, that killer can be um, in that five people, in the five suspects. So that can be your killer's one of them. And then at least four other suspects and how they're connected to the crime. So you're going to be doing this very quickly. Uh, but I have faith in you. I have faith you'll, and if you know, if you end up with, you know, four and, you know, a kind of an idea, that's fine too. But we're going to be breaking up into those groups and you guys are going to come um, up with the killer, you know, basic, the basic premise. And it could even be um, something as, you know, a murderer. Well, I'll take a historical, we'll say a, a murderer happened to, to a, a Chinese immigrant on the railroad uh, working on the railroad in the 1880s. Okay, it can be that that broad at this point, okay? But then I want you to come up with the different people. So it's characters. All right? Okay. Any questions about how that works? Um, could you name the, the, uh, the possible uh, categories to break into again? You said his Yes, you're breaking one. into, um, and, it, and they'll, it'll be on the... Um, the breakout. In fact, I'm going to let Laura explain the breakout a little bit better, but it's code, the breakout, the room, ah, the breakout rooms, one will be cozy, and you're already assigned to them, so even if you might not be a cozy person, oh. you know, go with it. Okay. One's police, one's PI, and then one, the last one is other. And just for reference, you are going to get a, a message on your screen that says you're being assigned to a breakout room. There will be a button that says join, please press the join button. Otherwise Maybe. it gets really complicated. I may have set it to where you go automatically, but if not, click join. All right, and I will see yeah. you all in 15 minutes. Have fun. All right, thank, thank you. you. Hi folks, do you have fun? Yeah, yeah sort of. No? <laughs> Catherine's yeah. like, no. Was it hard, is that yes. why? It's just uh, that was great. We, so we decided that we're going to let you figure out who killed our person. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Do we have everyone back? No, not quite. Yes. We needed another hour. <laughs> I know. These are and these are just sketches. In fact, you're going to say the same thing in the next one. You're like, it's not enough time. But these are just guys to get you, you know, get you rolling. When you think about how hard it is to agree with yourself <laughs> on something, you know, yes. on these options, right? Yes, and trying to have a group do it. Yeah, that's pretty tough too. But so did you all end up being able to find um, five characters? We, we didn't really Everybody come what? out with, so we didn't really come out with suspects specifically, but we came out with a premise for of course, you were listening in on our meeting, so you probably. I wasn't that. actually. I turned it down. I turned it down, so I haven't heard anything. So, actually, Matthew, let's let your group go first. Why don't you tell us about what you came up with? Well, we decided that there are these employees who are work. I think they're all immigrants or something. They're working for this racist boss, and he turns up dead during their shift, and they have. And our main char character is the people who the police think did, and he has to prove, find out who really did it to prove it wasn't him. Okay, so is your main, the guy who, uh, your main character who has to prove it, is he, a, is he an amateur then? Is he an employee? Yeah, yeah. we thought, we thought we would, because we, we're in the other category, because we thought if it's a professional, then we'd be going into one of the other categories. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Daryl, did you want to say something about your, uh, your protagonist? Yeah, we just thought that since he was an immigrant, he probably was a professional in his original country. Oh. But coming over here, oftentimes you can't transfer that. So you end up working yeah. what job you can find. Oh, that's lovely. And then also the nice thing I like about that one is, remember I said make him interesting? He's going to have a very different perspective um, on, you know, our culture, right? So that's going to be, that would be really interesting too. Did you, so this other suspects, you said you didn't quite get to that or are they the other employees? Or? Well, yeah, well, yeah, there are the other employees, but we didn't sort of make up who they were exactly. We're, we're just trying to figure out how 
no, no, no one knows how, no one knows who did it uh -huh. uh, or it's like, Okay, no, that's good. I know, like I said, this is tough, and I and it and if I were doing this, it'd be like a whole weekend, and we'd I don't know, eat and drink, and um. Okay, so employees racial loss, and okay. So one of the other groups want to tell me about your premise and your I'm not, your premise and your characters. Oh, Catherine. Okay. Then. Let me try and unmute myself. Am I unmuted? Um, yes. Yeah, we kind of played a game of Clue is what we did. And, um, and which group were you? Um, the police. Okay. And racial hatred. Um, so we came up with a dead Chinese man in the bedroom of the foreman's wife who was killed with a knife. <laughs> we think it's a crime of passion. There was a lot of struggle. Ian said there was blood everywhere. Um, we have a white foreman. We have the wife of the foreman who's a suspect. We also have a gay lover of the Chinese man who was dead. And Steve suggested that we call in the Pinkerton Agency to help solve the crime. Okay, so. Sorry. <laughs> so your suspects are the foreman, the wife, the gay lover. Right now? Okay, awesome. And the Pinkerton, so it's that's your police. Okay, and um, next group. Uh, we were the uh, PI group. Okay. So uh, our PI was a second generation immigrant. He belongs to a minority religion, uh, Bamar in Myanmar. So he's really excited that somebody who is a religious leader from Myanmar is coming to the country. Uh, the crime takes place outside a uh, local immigrant center where people meet for support and get jobs, ESL classes and all that. Um, one suspect is someone from Myanmar, but a different religion who doesn't approve and with the first person. Another suspect is, is someone who just wants to shut the place down because they don't want all these foreigners here. There's someone from a neighboring country who has a reason to dislike the victim. There's someone who is particularly opposed to the victim's religion. There's an employee or staff member who the victim may have seen do something illegal. And there's a neighbor where the victim's family is going to move who doesn't want foreigners moving into the neighborhood. Awesome. Oh, great. And I want to point something out um, that you guys did that I didn't even talk about. It was really nice. Is um, one of the suspects can have something that is not really, uh, can have a, a secret or a connection to the crime to the person that has really nothing to do with the crime. So, for example, um, the one you picked was um, an employer staff who may have seen something, you know, something happen. And it may have been something that happened, it may not. It may have nothing to do with the actual crime, but they become a suspect because they're hiding something. And that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about next is everybody is gonna be hiding something. Um, and so that's a way that you can, because you know, obviously they're all probably not murderous and they all might not actually really be connected to a murder, but they might be hiding, or the, the other person uh, we had before, they might be hiding the fact that they're gay, that they were a gay lover of the foreman because they're trying to protect the foreman's, um, you know, memory, whatever like that. So they're, but they're hiding something so they become suspect. So that's, that's great. And then we had, we have a cozy group. What did the cozy group come up with? Uh, uh, Darren was going to be our spokesperson. Yes. Awesome. Okay. There I he is. I shall do my best. So we thought that this could be a paranormal cozy mystery set ah. in an alternate universe in which humans and jinn, better known in this country as genies, uh, live side by side. Uh, our story is set in small town coastal Oregon and deals with racial hatred, the unanimous, the, the uh, voted upon theme, with um, intersection at with intersectionality with queer relationships and climate change, particularly fires, which most of us who live here in Oregon will know something about from last summer. So 
our so our protagonist is a boy or man, um, and he's in he's not a professional detective. He just lives in the town, and his pro and the prime his boyfriend, who is a jinn, is the primary suspect because the uh, method of the murder is arson, is fire. And the victim is a visiting executive from a logging company since Coastal Oregon relies a lot on um, yeah, logging in their economy. Our other suspects are a female, a female jinn, a third character, um, a rival from another corporation, the victim's secretary and a first uh, a first responder, probably a firefighter, to the crime scene. Awesome! Awesome! One awesome. of the one of the interesting tidbits that Darren brought to this, along with most of what's here, is that in this in the mythology he's been looking at, Jin are creatures that are made of fire, created out of fire, and what, humans or water? Is that what you said? That, well, I read this on Wikipedia, take this with a grain of salt, take yeah. it with a grain of salt, but apparently, oh, no. according no. to the Quran, Allah made humans from mud and the jinn from fire. There, and that is, that is why it, the suspect, the, 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 the logical place to go for the suspect once you know it's arson, is to the gin community. Right. That's, that's right. kind of important. And, and thank you, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> oh, these are wonderful. These are so good. And you know, I'm also realizing um, just quickly that, of course, I, I planned this out like, you know, here's 2.45 all at a time. And of course, we're taking more time. So, Laura, we're not going to go to the next breakout room. We're going to do this all together. You hear me okay? Yep, no problem. Okay, awesome. Okay, because what I want to talk about now is what you go, where you go, now you've got this group, or you, you've got your premise, and you've got an idea of, of your group. So, like I said, for me, and I, there's what we call pantsers and plotters. You know, there's the people that really, really, really outline. There's the people that just go by the seat of their pants. Um, I fall somewhere in the middle. But I think most of the people I know, whether they're pantsers or plotters, have a pretty good idea about character before they start. Um, and I think it's especially important in mystery because mysteries tend to be series. And the reason you come back to a series is for the character. You're not, I mean, you're coming back because also you like how the author protagonist solves the puzzle. You like the idea of the puzzle. You like the world, the setting, but you're going to really, you're basically your mystery kind of lives or dies on your characters. So that's why we're starting off with these. So once we have um, your characters, what I always do, and I put this on your sheet here, is I um, complete a character analysis for each character. And the things I always include are these top ones here. And I'll talk about that in just a second as well as I have a drink of water. Um, and this, again, partly comes actually from a, a playwriting perspective. Um, I think that's one of the ways I learned to do this. But I want to talk about each of these and tell you how it worked in, in, in Phantom for me. And then, um, then we're going to do it with one of your characters and maybe a couple of your characters that we have time for. <clears throat> so first of all, we have, we have five things that we go through. Motivation, goal, conflict, um, secret, and epiphany. Um, Motivation and goal sometimes get a little confused. And the motivation is the internal driver, the emotion that is pushing someone forward. And the goal is the concrete thing they want. <sighs> Bless you. So for example, in The Phantom of Oz, Ivy, my protagonist, one of her, her motivation to um, solve this particular crime is that she is worried about her friend, the one who is obvious he has bulimia. She's worried about her friend. That's the motivation. She's concerned for her. There's something wrong. Her goal is to get her help. These are two different things. She's worried about her. That's what's driving her. The goal is actually to get her into like, you know, some kind of a help situation. Um, because she's the protagonist, I usually have a couple of motivations and goals going on. 
So for her, another one, and this might help you a little bit with the goal motivation thing, is um, Ivy's, they all take place in the theater. And so Ivy wants to further her acting career. She wants to further her acting career. That's a desire of hers always. She wants to be a better, she wants to keep, you know, being an actor, getting better roles and getting better pay. Her goal in this one is to get a job with the touring company. So she wants to be a better actor, but she has a concrete goal, get a job with the touring company. She wants to help her friend. She has a concrete goal, get her help. Okay. So I always have, there's those two things. Um, there's always got to be conflict and there should be conflict inherent in, you know, those, that the premise that's going on for your character. So for example, on this one in Phantom, um, Ivy, she wants to help her friend, but her friend does not want to help. She doesn't want help. She doesn't think she needs help. Um, they have a big fight. That's the conflict. You can't help somebody who doesn't want help, but she sees her circling the drain and she's trying, right? So there's conflict there because she's trying to rescue her friend who doesn't want to be rescued. Her conflict with the acting job is if she goes on tour, she gets the job, she has to leave her brother and her boyfriend. And touring jobs in the theater are often months. They're not like business trips. They're, they're a ways, they're a wild way. So those conflicts are kind of built in. They're already built into the, the premise. Um, Actually, let me go back and just ask, do you guys have, do you understand the difference between motivation and goal? Yeah, okay. Sounds like, um, and I always make sure that there's a secret. Um, now, Ivy, not so much your protagonist, although maybe, but like I said before, each of those people, each of your suspects <laughs> has to have a secret. And I'm not gonna tell you <laughs> once in my book, because I want you to read the book and, be, and uh, you know, I'd be giving things away, right? But they have to have something they're hiding. Um, in the ones you guys talked about, that gay lover, he might be hiding that he's gay. He might be hiding that he's also um, got a wife and kids back in Mexico. He might be hiding um, all sorts of things that don't even matter that much. To, you know, he might be hiding um, that he's wealthy and he's been pretending to be poor because he thinks people are going to steal all his money. It can be anything. But they have to be hiding something so that they look suspicious and don't tell the truth all the time. Okay. And then an epiphany. Each of them, and especially your main character, um, but I like to have each of them have some kind of epiphany along the way. Your main character's got to grow. Um, because, and, and even it, um, when I'm planning a series, I plan mini arcs and a big arc. Um, so I know that Ivy's going to go from here to here. Um, and, and with just her, so you kind of understand that idea. I, uh, I decided she was going to grow three ways. She's going to grow as an actor. She's going to grow as a PI and she's going to grow as a person. So her PI arc is pretty obvious. She first starts working at the office. She gets a job. She starts to learn some of the insides. There's one point where she has to like learn firearms. There's part, she has to kind of learn things along the way. So she becomes actually a PI. So there's an arc, but each one, she has something that she learns along the way. Um, so, and your characters should probably, even the, uh, the other ones should hopefully have an epiphany. There is, um, in my second book, there are two characters who realize, um, that, they're, that they really love each other. It's an epiphany. Um, they're uh, in other books. Sometimes the epiphanies are, sometimes it's just really simple that they're worthwhile. They're a worthwhile person. Sometimes it's um, the epiphany, the killer has an epiphany that they shouldn't be killing people. I mean, it really depends on what's going on. But each of those characters needs a little, needs to have something. And especially, like I said, your protagonist. So um, what we're going to do right now is I want to take uh, one of your characters, and if we have time, we'll do more than one, and I want to see if we can come up with a, a goal, a motivation goal conflict and secret and epiphany for them. So actually, um, let's see which one we want to do. Okay, let's um, let's use 
I want to use a suspect here, I think. So, let's use, these are also good. I'm having a hard time figuring it out. Um, the person, well, let's use the one from the um, minority religion, the, the religious leader that comes and is killed, okay? And let's take the um, character who wants to shut down, it's, is it a mosque or a temple? Do we have a temple? Community center. Community center, okay. Let's take the person who, needs to who wants to shut down the community center. So that is our suspect. Let's call them CC right now because community center, they wanna shut down the community center, so CC. Okay, CC wants to shut down the community center. So what is a motivation that we could assign to CC? They want to actually, okay, here's the motivation she wants to, I mean, there's actually, their motivation and goal are kind of inherent in that wants to shut down community center. We just need to break it out a little bit. Why would they want to shut down the community center? What's the emotion behind that? But to keep the keep the area white. Okay, and what's the emotion behind that? Fear. Fear. Okay, so there's a fear. So the motivating emotion is fear and suspicion. And, and suspicion. They're afraid that <clears throat> the community won't be like they won't be like before won't accept. And actually, you can break that down too. It's like, okay, what are they actually afraid of? And this is always actually an exercise that I sometimes do with people I don't agree with. <laughs> I'm like, so what's behind that? What, why, why do they not want the community to be white? What's the fear behind that? Well, property values are often brought up, but that's probably more simple. Okay. Well, that could be, that can, and sometimes that's part of it. Could they be afraid of property values? What do you think, what else is going on? In, in loss, internal loss of loss of power, loss of power. Okay, loss of power. That's another motivation. The way they were raised to think about other races. Okay. Yes, they could be a way. They just really believe that they are inferior. You could really be raised that way. So you've got all this. See how it's kind of starting. Just this motivation is really good. It's really rich because you've already got. You got fear and you've got some specific things like property values, which you could, you know, really talk about those, right? So those can be in the open. The other stuff, you know, some of the things like maybe about how they're raised, that's probably going to be closed down. They're not going to actually say that out loud, right? But it's a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. It can be the reason that they can justify what else they're doing. So maybe exactly. maybe they know that there's a, you know, Blackbeard's, pirate treasure is hidden in the basement of the community center, but it's this prejudice and fear that make, allows them to justify what they're, what they end up doing. Okay. Yes. There could, and there could, yeah, that's another thing. There could be a couple of reasons for people to want to shut down things too, yeah. but yes, they can justify that. And also, like I said, that, that motivation, the motivation is usually pretty in and deep. It's like, it's an emotion. It's something they're raised with. It's something that really drives people. And it's usually deep, even though surface, it comes to the surface and things like property values. Okay. So what is the goal of this person? We already know that, don't we? Yep. That's what is it? To shut down the community center. I suppose you could add to that and say that maybe there's something he really wants to build there instead. Like Maybe he's a developer and he wants to build a high rise on that spot or something. Okay. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you could have things that complicate it, it's great. Because remember, you got to fill, you know, a couple hundred pages of book. So the more complications you can add, and you can always take this out too later if they don't fit. But these are great. So they want to shut down the community center, possibly because um, they want to build something there, possibly because bluebirds, bluebeards treasures in the basement, possibly just because they really don't want it in their backyard. All those they're, are good. They're going they're a politician um, in, a, in a district that has a lot of white supremacists and they want to win the election. Oh, yep, that would be great, yep. 
but we're talking about why they don't want the community center there, but there's also why did they kill somebody? How does that keep the community center from being? Like, did, they, did they do it or are they a suspect? Are they just well, a suspect? Well, we still have to have a reason for why they would think that if that person was dead. Oh, then. Okay, so right. what could that be? Right. What could that be? If we, if we, if they killed them, why do they think that would help shut down the community? Center? Maybe this person found out something nefarious about the killer. Okay, so maybe it's maybe the shutting down the community center is not the reason for the death. See, this is good. Maybe the shutting down the center is not the reason. It's um, it looks like a reason, but the real reason is personal hmm. or what else but there, there has to be a reason why it looks like that could like killing the person could lead to the center being shut down at least i guess maybe the this guy who this guy is like the leading figure who is who's leading is like the leader of the community and everyone looks to him and oh without him the community center will, will collapse in a week or something and he was the one who was really standing up and says no we won't shut this down and without him doesn't look like they might look like they might not survive okay yeah I think without leadership they don't have it he could become a suspect because of something that he let slip that he was actually there at the time of the murder and he's just an obvious suspect and he's an unpleasant guy who wants to close the community center. Right. And see, the cool thing you're doing right now is all these things that you're talking about, your protagonist is going to uncover this stuff, right? So you're getting all these things that you know your protagonist is going to figure out. And sometimes they'll go down the wrong road. You know, sometimes they'll go down the road of, um, you know, they want to shut it down because Bluebeard's, you know, treasures in the basement. Um, you know, or or killing him would shut down it, you know, when they really just wanted to kill him. So there's all these different kind of wrong places you can take. So that's that's great. Um, what would, I want to know, um, actually, we talked about this a little, well, conflict. Let's go to conflict. What is the conflict um, that this character would have? Um, I mean, just any kind of inherent conflict with the premise. What was your last word? With the, what? with the premise. So uh, what what kind of conflict would this character experience given um, that there is a community center and somebody murdered? Mm -hmm. You're talking about the protagonist. No, we're talking about the suspect still. CC. Oh, okay. so, I, I guess, well, you want, obviously you want to prove like, well, this guy was a porn in my side, but I didn't want him dead or something. Okay, so there can be innocence, right? There's kind of conflict about, you know, I'm innocent. There could be that. <clears throat> Any other kind of things that could happen um, because of this that would make conflict with the, the well, character? Well, well, maybe like the people who, like the members of the community center are like, they obviously suspect him immediately. And he's like, and, you know, like we got to go after this guy. He must be responsible. And the detective is like, no, no, we have to find out who really did it. Maybe it was this guy, maybe not. We have to know. Good. You brought up a good point. There could be internal and external conflict. So the external conflict is that the other members of the community center are maybe, you know, targeting CC, right? Yes. So that could be the external conflict. The internal conflict could be um, I really did that, this because I that, hated that, the guy. And that could lead oh. to another. That could lead to another suspect, actually, because because maybe he's maybe it could be like well, because maybe there be might be one character who really wants to blame it on CC, and then they're like, well, maybe this guy did it to blame it on CC so they can get rid of him and not have uh, and not have the development. I mean, it all kind of circles back, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. I want to go through these last two kind of things really quickly and then uh, and then move on a little bit about how to we're on plot. Um, so what kind of secret? And we've oh. already talked about this, but I, you've already come up with a couple of good ideas that, in talking about it, but what kind of secret might the neighbor be hiding, or Cece? Cece's hiding the secret, which oh. makes Cece look especially guilty. And it could be that Cece's the killer. 
or it could yeah. be let's let's pick another let's say cc's not the killer but there's a something that cc's hiding well maybe well, since he's a racist person maybe he's like in the kkk and he wants to keep that a secret or something okay it could be in the kkk yeah others i think robin earlier said something about um that was the way he was raised yeah. And so maybe, you know, maybe that's a secret. Maybe um, Cece's actually tried to hide the part, you know, the fact that he believes that, you know, the whites are, uh, you know, whites are superior. Maybe he's trying to hide like an internal fact that he really believes that. Maybe. Because especially if he's a community person or a developer, it's not a very popular opinion. Yeah, maybe he was a former KKK or white supremacist and is, you know, not really open about that, ashamed about it. Okay, good. And what about, think about what's something that's not even connected, just out of the blue, something that's not even connected to the case that Cece might be trying to hide. Well, maybe he's having an affair. That's, that's the cliche one, right? Yep, an affair. Others? Could be money, money laundering, financial uh, crimes. Yep, mm -hmm. could be that, that development stuff they're doing is, yeah, it could be money laundering, could be some dirty money there. So, like I said, it doesn't have to be connected to the crime. It just, they have to be somehow connected. But their secret doesn't necessarily. Um, and epiphany, what kind of epiphany could, we're going to say that this is not, Cece's not the killer. So what kind of epiphany could Cece have by the end of the book? Well, the obvious one is like, well, I guess the community center is okay. These people aren't so different, yada, yada. That's okay. the obvious one anyway. It's it's obvious, but it's a nice one too. Others? There was the thing about the victim belonging to a minority religion. He might actually find he likes that religion when he gets to know more about it. Yeah, here we go. I was thinking there could be a connection between also a conflict and an epiphany if maybe other members of this person's family um, are really interested in other cultures and there's like an intergenerational thing and maybe they actually invite him to some kind of um, ceremony and he sees um, how, how beautiful it is. And see, one of the things I love about Epiphany is one of the things I love about mysteries is to me, and this is a different, again, it's a little different like with crime fiction and noir and things. A mystery is about justice and a mystery at the end, most things are wrapped up. It's one of the it's one of the things that makes us feel good about it. You know who the killer is. You know, not always they're brought to justice, but usually there's like there's the hope that they're brought to justice, and there's something else that has changed in the community, so that you make this journey as a reader, and at the end there's a satisfaction, and something like those different epiphanies you guys gave me, you know, would be another satisfaction on top of catching the killer, which makes it multi layered. Good job. Um, so typically what I do, like I said, I start from character. I do this. I do this for all of my characters. Um, then as you'll notice, I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit because I want to talk about plot quickly before we get going. Um, I write a page in their voice because I have a really, I need to figure out who they are. And sometimes it'll take me more than a page. And especially if I'm trying to like start, um, afresh with a new protagonist, it often takes me a long time time. I mean, actually, it's, I'm going to be uh, tackling a rewrite, hopefully starting tonight, and I'm not really sure I still have the protagonist's voice right. I really need to work on that protagonist a little bit more. But I always, so I write in their voice, first person, just trying to get an idea of who they are and 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 usually about something that I think is going to happen in the book. If it was the gin, they might be writing about logging. They might be writing about climate change. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the actual murder but something that's going on in the book that they feel passionate about. Um, there are a couple different um, character uh, kind of analyses that I sometimes that you can go through. Um, I wrote them down. The Myers-Briggs assessment is kind of interesting. You know, it's a psychological assessment. You probably uh, might have done it for work at some point. It's online. You can just, you know, plug in and find some of the interesting things about your character. Um, if you do like you likes and dislikes physical attributes and how they feel about them, not just that they have, you know, curly red hair, but that, 
you know, it stands out when it rains and it makes them crazy, or they always wish their hair was straight, or they love it because it makes them look like flames, you know, whatever it is, ha kind of personalize <clears throat> physical attributes. Um, what you like about the character, that's another thing, because you want to really love your characters, you're going to be with them for a while. So figure out what you like about them. Because remember, every character, even the, you know, the villains, the bad guys, they have to, they believe they're good, right? They all believe they're doing the right thing for, for their family, for their country, for their race. They're all, they all believe they're doing the right thing. So you kind of have to get into their skin and, and like part of them. You might just like the part that, you know, um, takes the spiders outside instead of killing them. You know, it just, it could be something, but find something that you like about them. Um, I've given you, I think this is a new, the character questionnaires. Um, I really like, uh, John Fox has some really interesting blogs on his, uh, he's an editor. He has some really interesting blogs on his site. I put the link in there. And um, what I like about these is they're not the typical, you know, what's their hair color, what's their, um, uh, you know, where they go to school. They're a little, they're deeper than that, these particular ones. Um, I pulled them up and I'm not going to show them to you because I really, really want to talk about plot. But I usually go through a lot, a lot, a lot of work with character um, because to me, plot comes out of premise and character. In fact, you know, we've already started, um, some of you groups have already kind of got a good idea of like how your plot might even go, okay? I can already tell about that. So let's talk um, in our next nine minutes about plot quickly. Um, I've given you three different um, kinds of ways of uh, looking at plot through dramatic structure, um, mini movie method, and the snowflake method. I've used all of them. Sometimes I use more than one because I'm really having a hard time plotting things. And especially um, when I was with Henry, I'm, not, I'm no longer with Henry Press. There are, um, uh, they've, I'm not supposed to talk about what they're doing. So anyway, I'm no longer with Henry Press, but when I was with them, oh, I think the, um, I think the worksheet should be, I think you should have, have, have them as a handout. Laura, were you there? You should have gotten them as a handout. Did everybody get them? <laughs> I was in a little bit late. I thought oh, it was something was a little bit. Did you see it, Darren? I didn't see hear it. anything about a handout. I uh, emailed it in the newsletter. And it was part of the newsletter. Okay. So you should have okay. got it. I got it. Well, I read all my emails. Well, there were two okay. newsletters that had the link in. It was the first one that I put the handout in. And you, we, we can send that out again if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Oh, um, send as part of an email, fine. not as a, a separate attachment. Okay. Yeah, I can't send attachments. Email. Is it Sheila at uh, Sheila or is it admin or what? Admin. Okay, let me check and see if I can find it. Okay, you know what? I'm going to keep going while you guys are looking because I, you know, I'm so sorry. I thought I had plenty of time. <laughs> but so anyway, plot. Okay. Some of you, now that you have this kind of character stuff, if you're like, if you want to just be a pantser, you can go. You get your characters, you've got, you know who's getting killed. You can just go. Um, the good thing about just going is fun. The bad thing about just going is you get stuck. Um, and it often takes longer because you have to do a lot more revising afterwards because you're like trying to find all the, um, you know, the threads of your plot. Um, I... Some people um, make really, really, really detailed outlines. Uh, Phil Margolin basically writes like almost 100 pages of an outline before he writes his books. I mean, they're almost like first drafts. I tend to write um, mileposts. I use using either um, this dramatic structure, uh, the mini movie method, or the snowflake method. And I want to talk really quickly. The mini movie method is basically the dramatic structure broken down more. Um, and it's just that Chris Soft, who came up with the mini movie method, is a screenwriter who um, was noticing that films, and especially uh, more recent, they're, they're being broken into even smaller chunks. And so he just broke it into chunks. But the thing they both have in common 
is the very first thing you're doing, you establish the world of the story. Um, let's, I'm gonna keep going with the, um, the people from Myanmar because that's where we kind of started. So you'd be establishing the neighborhood. You'd be establishing where the community center is going in. You'd be establishing the, um, the fact that this religious leader is coming or is you know arriving and you a little bit of background about how excited everybody is, what they mean to the community. So you're establishing the world as it is. And then boom, right away, you have, and I do mean right away. My editor um, said I had to do it within 30 pages. There needs to be something that happens. Typically in mysteries, it's a murder. It could be also a disappearance. It could be, you know, the fire, the arson, it could be something, but it has to be something. And right now, the reason she used to say, um, it had to happen in 30 pages is because of Kindle. Because now when you look inside a Kindle and you look at the preview, you know, look inside, they give you a certain amount of pages and you want the reader to be hooked, get that first inciting incident, which is what they call it in the dramatic structure, that inciting incident um, in the first 30 pages. And I have a hard time sometimes doing that, by the way. I, I've, I have done it, but... Um, and you'll notice that we say inciting incident in both the dramatic structure. It's also in the mini movie method. Um, the first thing you do is establish the world, inciting incident, boom. Then you're gonna have to have a couple of things that happen. So in ours, we have the Myanmar person, boom, we're gonna have the murder, just for, for example right now, we have the murder. Then we're gonna have to have something that happens at the end of act one that Everything's kind of going along and then boop, something turns. The whole story turns on a dime. Maybe we find out at the end of act one that the leader from Myanmar is actually a former criminal. He's got a war criminal past. That changes everything, right? Maybe we find, uh, maybe there's, uh, we find out that um, one of the people involved is actually his uh, illegitimate son. Okay, it's got to be something big that changes the way the reader and the protagonist looks at the situation. Boop, changes. Um, one of these days, well, if you, you can watch this in movies. If you look at this dramatic structure and watch it in movies, you'll see it really easily. There's going to be another one of those things that happens, usually a little smaller one around the midpoint of the book. And then you're going to have the crisis where everything is lost. You think that things are, um, sometimes, okay, by the way, the midpoint, a lot of times it's another murder or another crime that's being committed in a mystery, or maybe a disappearance or something that's happening. But it's something big that, again, kind of changes the story. But then we have to have that kind of dark night of the soul, right? Where, and sometimes it's um, the protagonist, we'll say the protagonist um, blames the wrong person. And they get sent to jail and they're beat up horribly, okay? And it's all his fault because he sent the wrong person to jail. Um, it could be that he knows exactly who the right person is and they look like they've left the country. He's never going to find them. It's got to be something where your protagonist looks like they have failed. And then they pull themselves out usually by their, you know, depending on if it's a thriller, sometimes they actually pull themselves out. But usually with a mystery, they figure out a way around it. They figure out what to do. They, um, and then, uh, you know, bring the killer to justice. That's a really, really <laughs> quick and dirty way of describing that. And I'm sure you probably have questions about it. Uh, so let me ask your questions about it and I'll tell you really quickly about the snowflake method. But questions about that, um, the, the different kind of outline with a dramatic structure. Anybody? Okay. Um, it's really fun to talk about this, by the way. And I'm sorry, like I said, I apologize that it's taken longer. I, I have really good intentions. Um, so the snowflake method is another really interesting way. If you're not a signpost person, if you can't like think that far ahead and you can't make those jumps and leaps, which sometimes I can't either. 
Snowflake method is, um, and actually I pulled this up. I'm going to share my, I think I can share my screen. Let's see. You guys see that? Yeah. You can see my screen? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. I see she like, yes. Okay. So this is Randy Ingramson, by the way, he has a lovely, um, hang on, I'm trying to show you the top of this. Uh, he had, this is Randy Ingramson and he has a really good newsletter, by the way. Um, he doesn't teach anymore, but he has a really great blog and the newsletter out. And the snowflake method is basically you take one sentence, it's like a snowflake, you can, oops, go back here, hang on, you take, so a snowflake, if you're going to draw a snowflake, you start with the, you know, the um, triangle, then you kind of make it bigger and make it bigger and make it more, more complicated, same thing. So, he first has, and he says take an hour, sometimes it takes longer than an hour, sometimes maybe not, um, and writes a one sentence summary of your novel. This will also hold you in really good stead because when if you're pitching your book, this is gonna help you. So his, for example, he came, he ended up writing a rogue physicist travels back in time to kill the apostle Paul. That's the summary for his first novel. Um, he has some hints here. I put your, um, the website is in your handout. And once you have that first sentence, all you do is you expand it to a paragraph. You say, yeah, the rogue, you know, and um, here we go. Okay, this is where it kind of tells you a little bit, it's like a little bit like the dramatic setup again. I mean, the dramatic structure, the setup, the major disasters, the ending, kind of what I was talking about before. So in your third paragraph, you might say, um, you know, the person from the leader from Myanmar is killed. Um, midway through the story, we find out that he has an illegitimate son um, who's one of the suspects. You know, you just, you put in those different kind of disasters. And he talks a little bit about the three act structure, which is the first thing on here. Then he's doing the characters kind of, and so he's doing his characters a little bit later. You've already done them if you're going my way. So you would be able to fill those in pretty easily. Although he has also a one paragraph summary of the character's storyline. So what happens with that character in the story? So basically what he's doing is he kind of just keeps breaking out and breaking out. So this time he takes that summary paragraph and makes it a full paragraph. He takes all these different things and just kind of keeps going, okay, I've got that. And then he just makes it bigger. And it's kind of, it's the same, structure is just a more narrative way of approaching it and sometimes like some sometimes depending on what space I'm in I, it works better for me and like I said I've actually used all of these at some point so I'm not we're over time so I want to tell you two more things um one is let's see the biggest thing I have the advice I have is is revise, I wrote this really big, revise, 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 revise. It's, you're, you, you're not going to get it for, nobody gets it the first time. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Not even those wonderful writers that can, you know, write beautiful sentences quickly and they, nobody gets it the first time. Um, and I don't know anybody who sends a first draft to their editor or to the agent ever. Um, myself, I make, I usually go through a three, at least three before I even send it to an editor or an agent. And then it has several more again before it gets published. Um, because the first one is just getting the story out. You're just getting the story out. And you're going to have stuff you don't need. And you're going to have big plot holes. And you're probably going to change it as you go through. And you're going to realize that the character is already changed or you don't need a plot point is going to grow. And revision, so you're going to be revising your plot, you're going to be making your characters deeper, you're going to be making sure that the dialogue isn't, you know, on the nose or stilted. So please, 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 you know, that's revise, revise, revise. Um, and the last thing I have to say is I hope, wait, I think I'm on my front page, hang on. Yes. Oh, 
Yeah, my, my website is on the front page. Also my email. If you want to email me any questions since we're kind of, you know, running late, I would love that. Also, I want to hope that um, I have a newsletter that comes out every two months. It's called the Slightly Silly Newsletter. And it's mostly, um, since my books are kind of screwball, it's mostly that. It has a little bit of book news, but it has like a dead body photo or a place to hide a dead body, not a dead body photo. <laughs> They're very silly. Places to hide a dead body. You'll have to look and see what it is. Um, and, and a quiz and a random stuff that makes me laugh. And I I, I think you'll like it. Most of it's, a, it's pretty people like it. And I was also going to say, if you're interested in reading any of my books, I'm going to be doing a pretty big giveaway in the next couple of days um, from my newsletter list. I'm going to be giving away some copies of Ivy Get Your Gun in honor of um, Women's History Month. And also because I need some new dead body photos. Um, let me see if I can show you one really quick. I was going to pull one up. Um, ah, let me see if I can get my newsletter really quickly so you can see what I'm talking about. And, and basically the first five people that send me dead body photos after this email goes out ah, um, are going to win a book. And of course, everything's kicking me out. Hang on. And while I'm doing this, anybody have any questions about plot they would like to ask me? Cindy, I'd like to know how... Um how we get on your newsletter list. Which one, of, which one of these addresses is your newsletter list? So if you go to cindybrown.com, uh, right, cindybrownwriter.com, uh -huh. um, there's a link right there to sign up in the newsletter. Oh, good. And hang on, I'm going to show you the newsletter if I can find it really quickly so you can kind of see. Oh, bother. <laughs> it's like Laura went through a couple different computers. I'm going, I had this all pulled up. But let me, I do want to show it to you really quickly. It looks like, oh, these are all people writing to me about how they like it. Okay, I can't show it to you. If you go to the newsletter, you'll, you'll be able to see it at the, my website, you'll be able to see it there. Um, it'll say newsletter and there'll be a thing where you can slightly sit silly and you can click on it. And I apologize, I can't do it right now, but everything I was pulling up was people going, oh, I like last month's, you know, instead of showing it to you. So, wait, chat, looks like there's stuff in the chat. Um, yes, yes, I did meet you, Ruth. Yes. Yeah. I can share yeah. your newsletter if you want. Oh, thank you. Well done. Oh my God, that's hysterical. Yes, so show them, the, can you get down and show them the best, best places to hide the body? That's what I want to show people. Okay, so we always have um, something silly where I take a picture of, you know, and sometimes people are in it like my neighbors. Um, and what I'm looking for is some more pictures because I have been, you know, with quarantine, I've used up every place in my neighborhood, man. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then we have a trivia test. There's a little thing. Um, go down a little bit, could you, Sheila? Thank you. Um, I have another weekly blog that, if you're interested, is about kindness. Um, I have a little teaser in this one about the book. The thing was coming out. Keep going. Keep going. I want to show the last bit too. Oh, and then we have random stuff that makes me laugh. <laughs> Which, um, yes, that's Buster Keaton. And then we also, I usually there's a, usually a video in there too. It's Aww. just because it's fun. So the newsletters, that's the newsletter. Um, it comes out like every two months and I, I hope you're interested in it. And you can always, like I said, ask me any questions about uh, anything I've talked about at that, the um, email that's there. And Darren, I think it's pretty hysterical that they're watching Mr. Person <laughs> through the whole thing, right? And I think any questions before I have to leave? Okay, and I know it was quick, but I think you guys got a little bit of an idea of how to actually, because you cut your hands in it a little bit, yeah? Yes. Thank yeah. you, Cindy. Cindy, this was like a short course yeah. writing a no mystery novel. This has been just great. Good, 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 good. Well, I hope so, and I hope you all have fun, and if you, you know, 
If you're inspired, I hope you keep writing. And can I put the worksheet on, worksheet on the website for anyone who couldn't find it? Certainly, that would be great. That's Thank a good you. way to do it. Thank you, Sheila. Okay, I'll do that. And also, Sheila, and whoever else helped um, figure out Zoom um, breakout rooms earlier, thank you for that, too. <laughs> thank you, Laura, for that. <laughs> yes, thank you, Laura. That was great, too. That worked well. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, all. Happy thank writing. You. Happy reading. Thank you. Bye. This is great. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.